45% of the calories are coming from protein, 47% of the calories are coming from fat, and about 8, 8.5% eight of the calories are coming from carbohydrates. So it's pretty safe to say that it's a very suitable approach for ketogenic dieting and keeping your brain into ketosis and staying very, very productive during the day. Vigorous Steve here with a 2,500 calorie ketogenic diet that covers most, not all, but most of the micronutrients and their respective dietary reference intakes, as well as the upper tolerable limit where applicable, which are established by the Office of Dietary Supplements at the American Institute of Health. Now, I always considered that the dietary reference intakes and the upper tolerable limit were a little bit like a guideline to assess micronutrient requirement. But as a bodybuilder or somebody who is physically very active, certain micronutrients need to be consumed in much larger quantities than are established in the DRIs or the upper tolerable limit. So keep that in mind. This is just a guideline for um, diet design. And of course, when you're restricting dietary carbohydrates on a ketogenic diet, certain micronutrients might be a little bit difficult to acquire and require supplementation. Now, the dietary reference intakes doesn't cover certain phytochemicals or flavonoids or other things which are beneficial for bodybuilding. Not even all the amino acids are covered on the, you know, most of the nutritional databases. So keep that in mind. But let's see how far we can get with food sources alone. We still need supplementation on this diet. I've tried to design many diets without any form of supplementation, but in most cases, you know, due to caloric restriction, supplementation in one way or another is usually required because you can't simply get everything from food, especially if you're restricting calories. In this diet, we're restricting our caloric intake to 2,500 per day which is, uh, you know, pretty applicable for the majority of the people. Now, personally, I'm going to work my way up to this particular ketogenic diet, even though I might still change some particular vegetable sources around. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to increase my caloric intake to 2,500 um, because I've been in a caloric restrictive state for a pretty long time. So reverse dieting from a fasting mimicking diet, um, you know, needs a little bit of a diligence. And then hopefully I'll end up at 2,500 calories or 3,000 calories on a ketogenic diet, which is going to look very comparable to the diet we're going to discuss in this video. I just wanted to make it a little bit broader and a little bit more applicable for the audience so you guys can take something away from it, even though I might not be eating certain dietary food sources that are on that list. It's still pretty complete for everybody to learn something from. Now, before you copy paste this ketogenic diet and put it on your kitchen cabinet and start following it to the T, just keep in mind that this is just a general overview of what is possible with a ketogenic diet while limiting, you know, supplementation to the bare minimum. And I'm not taking into consideration your individual ability to digest the foods which are found on this ketogenic diet or your individual ability to absorb particular micronutrients. Again, everybody's different. Everybody digests foods different. Everybody absorbs micronutrients differently. So it's probably a good starting point, but some manipulation and adjustments is certainly required. So keep that in mind. And with it further ado, let's get into the diet, discussing the overall meal planning. Now, it's 2,500 calories, so most of their meals are going to hover around 500 calories per meal, consisting of about 45 to 50 grams of protein, minimal carbohydrates below 10 grams per meal to, you know, stay within the budget of 50 grams of carbohydrates per day, you know, which should ensure, ensure a ketogenic state after a couple days after liver glycogen and skeletal muscle glycogen stores have been depleted and glycogen in the brain also. And the fat intake is going to hover around 15 to 20 grams per meal. Meal one, eight egg whites. These are the XL egg whites. So those are about 45 grams per egg white. Eight of them, two whole eggs, half an avocado, 
one Brazil nut, one tablespoon of chia seeds, 150 grams of spinach, and about one-fifth of a teaspoon of Himalaya pink salt. That's about one gram of Himalaya pink salt. We'll add that to each meal um, because I do like sodium intake and I'm going to assume that everybody here is at least in one shea way or form physically active and sweating buckets during their workout routine. And, you know, for that you need a little bit of additional sodium. Of course, the egg whites and the whole eggs have a decent amount of sodium, but it uh, doesn't hurt to supplement a little bit on top. Unless you have a very poor blood pressure and uh, you need uh, to manage your blood pressure by limiting sodium intake. Again, individual response highly determines which of these um, aspects of this diet you can incorporate for yourself. Meal 2, 200 grams of chicken breast or turkey breast, 30 grams of sunflower seeds or almonds, 1 tablespoon of ground flax seeds, and I prefer the ground flax seeds, not the whole flax seeds, which are impossible to crunch, and uh, you know the, the fiber and the husk around whole flax seeds is almost impossible to digest, so you'll be better off to grind them down. Let's see, 150 grams of broccoli. So yes, that's the chicken and broccoli, but it's a ketogenic diet, so there's no brown rice at meal two. And again, one gram of Himalaya pink salt. Meal three, 250 grams of sea bass or flounder filet. We're doing a little bit more than usual, 250 grams, because sea bass and flounder or any white fish that you prefer doesn't have so much protein, and we're still trying to get around 45 to 50 grams of protein per meal. Again, half an avocado, one tablespoon of chia seeds, again, 150 grams of Brussels sprouts, and a dash of Himalaya pink salt. Meal four, 200 grams of lean beef, and it can be a rump steak, sirloin, strip loin, whatever you prefer, where you can trim off most of the fat. Of course, there's going to be some fat within the steak, but try to go with a cut where you can uh, remove the fat from the beef so you can get your fat intake from other sources like oils, seeds, nuts, or, well, fruit, right? Uh, avocado is a fruit, even though it has a lot of fat inside and a little bit of carbohydrates and fructose. And oh, let me mention that here. For the guys that say uh, that avocado, because of the fructose content, is going to kick you out of ketosis, train a little bit harder so that fructose has somewhere to go, yeah? Really, everybody that I've worked with over the last couple of years that eats a whole avocado per day, nobody ever got kicked out of ketosis from the little bit of fructose and carbohydrates which are found within the avocado. So please, give it a rest. Let's see, what else is on the meal four? Oh yeah, 200 grams of lean beef with 10 grams of beef liver, which we're eating for specific purpose to get a little bit more retinol vitamin A. Now, most of the animal meat sources have a little bit of retinol vitamin A, but I'd still like to get a little bit more in for skin health and hair health. So besides getting your vitamin A from beta carotene, you can also get your vitamin A from retinol from animal meat sources. And beef liver is certainly very high in retinol, but I wouldn't raise my beef liver intake beyond 25 grams per day because then you're pushing against the upper tolerable limit of retinol being 10,000 IUs per day. So I believe that, you know, if you're frequently eating animal meat sources, which already contain a little bit of retinol, you shouldn't eat more than 25 grams of beef liver because then you're really pushing against that 10,000 IUs of retinol vitamin A and you will get dry skin, especially on your hands. From what I noticed when I did the carnivore diet with 25 to 30 grams of beef liver per day, your hands, because you're frequently washing, right? Meal prep, going to the gym, showering, etc. Your hands get pretty dry, especially your knuckles, and then the face starts to get pretty dry as well. And this was without the inclusion of Accutane, mind you. So, 10 grams of beef liver per day at meal four, half a tablespoon of olive oil or macadamia nut oil, being about 7.5 milliliters. Again, one tablespoon of ground flax seeds, because I do like a little bit of extra fiber and omega-3s. That's why we like ground flax seeds or chia seeds with each meal, and unfortunately there's no alternative for those besides supplementation, obviously, or adding a little bit of uh, salmon or sardines with each meal, but, you know, considering that uh, 
would probably make everything a little bit unpalatable when you start to combine particular food sources with other food sources. Again, I would rather have all of the salmon at the last meal before bed. Let's see, meal four has 150 grams of asparagus as well, and of course, a dash of Himalaya pink salt. Meal five, 225 grams of wild Atlantic salmon filet. And again, it's particular for the vitamin D content, which you can't get anywhere else besides supplementation or 20 minutes of full body sun exposure. And even then, you know, in particular parts of the world, especially very northern parts, it's very hard to get 20 minutes or 30 minutes of full body exposure. And even then, it might not be sufficient to get adequate vitamin D synthesis in the skin. Now, I understand that wild, wild Atlantic salmon isn't affordable for everybody. And, you know, the less wild and the more farmed you get with your uh, salmon choices, the less vitamin D it's going to contain. So supplementation might still be required. And even then, 225 grams of wild Atlantic salmon filet doesn't contain you know, what we would consider to be optimal vitamin D3 intake of about 4,000 to 5,000 IUs per day. We'll add to that one tablespoon of chia seeds again, 10 grams of walnuts, and 150 grams of kale. So, this diet looks pretty good. We'll get 285 grams of protein, pretty high for a ketogenic diet, but hey, it's a modified ketogenic diet for people who train with hypertrophy in mind and, you know, need a little bit of extra protein to uh, recover that uh, traumatic, uh, traumatized muscle, you know, four times, uh, five times going to the gym, trying to failure and trying to, to create some trauma on your skeletal muscle needs a little bit more protein intake. So you get about 240 grams of protein from animal meat sources and about 40, 45 grams of protein from vegetables, nuts, seeds, etc. Right, this diet only has 53 grams of carbohydrates, still a little bit higher than what is generally considered to be acceptable on a ketogenic diet, but it's all coming from vegetables. It shouldn't have really any effect on your blood glucose concentrations, allowing you to stay in ketosis. You're getting a decent amount of fiber, 58 grams over the course of the day. So, yeah, well, you can uh, use your imagination what's going to happen. And on this diet, you get 130 grams of fat, all coming from healthy sources. So the caloric breakdown is as follows. You get 2,540 calories in total for about 2 kilos and 430 grams of actual food mass. 45% of the calories are coming from protein. 47% of the calories are coming from fat. And about eight, eight and a half percent of the calories are coming from carbohydrates. So it's pretty safe to say that it's a very suitable approach for ketogenic dieting and keeping your brain into ketosis and staying very, very productive during the day. Even though the vegetable intake might be uh, need to increase a little bit if you're uh, suffering from hunger pain, because again, you know, protein sources, fat sources, and vegetables without a little bit of uh, carbohydrate bulk might digest uh, pretty fast, even though you should have uh, not so high appetite, again, considering that your brain is in ketosis. Now, this is a pretty good overview of, of the diet, right? You, you see the, the protein, the carbohydrates, the fiber, and the fats. So let's get into the micronutrients and the composition of all of these food sources. Starting with protein, you can see that most of the animal meat sources contain a pretty decent ratio between the branch chain amino acids, being the isoleucine, the leucine, and the valine. Still, on this diet, you won't get the super ideal uh, ratio between leucine, isoleucine, and valine being, you know, in most of the supplements, you get a 2 to 1 to 1 ratio, or some of them even have more leucine in a 4 to 1 to 1 ratio. So this diet, leucine is about 1.75 in relation to isoleucine being the one and the valine is about 1.2. So it's a little bit different ratio than is generally uh, touted in the branch chain amino acid supplements. Still, it should give you plenty of branch chain amino acids and essential amino acids on a meal-to-meal -meal basis for proper anabolism. 
and feel free to supplement with a little bit of leucine with each meal to start that sweet, sweet protein synthesis. Besides the branch chain amino acids, I also keep track of the glycine to methionine ratio because you don't want your methionine higher than your glycine because it impacts your connective tissue. Now, in a lot of cases, you would need to supplement with collagen or gelatin to get this ratio a little bit higher, still with the, the animal food sources that I was able to select for this ketogenic diet. The ratio is pretty close. I like twice the glycine for the methionine. And this diet has about 1.75 the glycine compared to the methionine. Now, when it comes to carbohydrates, there's obviously not much carbohydrates that we can discuss in a ketogenic diet. It is of note that kale at 150 grams before bed contains about 12 grams of carbohydrates, excluding the fiber that's contained within kale. Again, we're eating all these vegetables for very specific reasons regarding their unique micronutrient profile. So it might be required to eat a little bit more vegetables to get the desired amount of micronutrients. In, in case of kale, you know, it's, it's very high in vitamin K, for example. We'll get into that a little bit later. So feel free to reduce these vegetables to 100 grams per servings or, or you know, move them around. Let's say you want the, these 12 grams of carbohydrates before your workout. You have kale pre-workout. It's not going to make a difference, but hey, everybody likes to micromanage at their own accord. So, you know, I'm OCD enough to understand. Feel free to move these vegetables around to complement your workout. And if you really want to complement your workout on a ketogenic diet, a small serving of blueberries or bananas, you know, considering it has a little bit of fructose and, uh, you know, some extra carbohydrates, should help you with your exercise performance on those days where you're struggling a little bit. So a little bit of fruit... I feel that a little bit of fruit on a ketogenic diet is warranted, but you have to train like a beast. And if you're not training like a beast, not fruit for you. Now, you get a decent amount of fiber. You're actually getting more fiber than the amount of carbohydrates. So each meal has about 10 grams of fiber, maybe 12 grams of fiber. Again, helping to keep your stool regular and promote detoxification by binding up bowel acids, which are probably full with you know, cholesterol and toxins and all the stuff that you want out of your body. Um, so you use all this fiber to, um, you know, pass everything along and then uh, wave uh, it goodbye uh, when it flushes down the toilet. A little bit of starch, a little bit of sugar. That's all negligible. Don't worry about it. Let's move on to the fat. Now, the only of note, I highlighted all the micronutrients of note. So you see that whole eggs have reasonably high saturated fat with four grams, four and a half grams for two whole eggs. Most of the other food sources, considering they're, uh, you know, healthy, not, not farm raised or, you know, uh, completely abolished with, uh, you know, corn and that kind of stuff. Again, you know, individual micronutrient profile of where you get your food sources is going to vary highly depending on, you know, how much you spend. Unfortunately, so I understand that grass-fed beef and wild-caught salmon and free-ranging, uh, free-ranging chicken eggs is not affordable for everybody, but it will certainly change the, you know, the micronutrient intake that you have on a daily basis. So I, d I never go cheap on food. I would rather go cheap on clothes and uh, haircuts, like I mentioned in that video. I'll highlight that up above. Um, yeah, you can cheap on, go cheap on other places, but I never go cheap on food because it's uh, every time you eat a meal, it contributes or detracts from your health. So I would rather have it contribute to my health. Okay, so saturated fat. The only thing of note is whole eggs and uh, perhaps in the beef, which contains about three grams of saturated fat. A little bit of saturated fat is okay, but we're still staying below the maximum of 10% of the total calories. Right now, our saturated fat intake is about 7-8% to 8 of the total amount of calories that we're taking in every day, meaning you know, our maximum is about 28 grams of saturated fat per day, and we're only at 22 grams of saturated fat per day. Now, the monounsaturated and the polyunsaturated fats are pretty balanced, and so are the omega-3s and the omega-6s. Now, they all undergo similar enzymatic reactions. 
Of course, Omega-3 doesn't cover the DHA and the EPA in depth. For that, you would need to eat salmon or sardines or, you know, tuna, which also has a little bit of EPA and DHA. But, you know, if you really want to increase your EPA and DHA content, it's probably better to have a high potency fish oil with each meal. Now, we have salmon for the last meal and chia seeds or flax seeds with each meal. So that means each meal contains at least two and a half, in some cases three and a half, and up to, what is it, seven grams of omega-3. Helps to keep systemic inflammation down, promotes insulin sensitivity, and, uh, you know, keeps your skin very, very nice. So I like the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio to be about one to one. I've gone up as high as two to one on the omega-3s compared to the omega-6s, and that really improved my skin health and skin texture. Just keep in mind, I was also running Prima Bone at that time, so I'm, I'm sure that contributed also a little bit. On this diet, you're getting about a thousand milligrams of cholesterol. I don't really think that's a big deal. Um, and if that is a big deal to you, there's many supplementations to get your serum cholesterol concentrations under control. And, you, you know, the fact that it has almost 60 grams of fiber, promotes a decent amount of cholesterol detoxification after it's been absorbed and then dumped into the bile acid. So you'll still absorb part of the cholesterol which is uh, coming in from your diet and then you'll detoxify the cholesterol that's uh, passing through the bile acid because you're having so much fiber in your diet. So I've seen blood work on myself and many of my clients on hormone replacement and even you know pretty significant dosages of anabolic androgenic steroids and their lipid profile is pretty favorable. And it's never going to be perfect when you're running steroids, but it's as good as it should be, or it's as good as it's going to be with a little bit of health supplementation and plenty of fiber and vegetables in place. So let's get into the vitamins. Beta carotene, vitamin A of note is the spinach with meal one and the kale at meal five, both will give you about 15,000 to 23,000 units of vitamin A, the beta carotene version of vitamin A, which has no established upper tolerable limit. And for the guys that ever dieted on sweet potato, they might even get 80,000 or 120,000 of uh, beta carotene per day. And, and then at one point, their skin starts to turn a little bit orangey. Um, so keep that in mind. You don't want your beta carotene intake to be too high, but I feel that, you know, below 50,000 units per day doesn't cause any skin discoloration. Now, if you were to add sweet potato to this um, ketogenic diet for a refeed, for example, again, you know, the beta carotene intake is uh, pretty substantial and you might want to lower your kale or spinach intake on a daily basis. When it comes to vitamin A, the retinol version, again, most of the dietary animal meat sources already contain a decent amount of retinol, but the beef liver, 10 grams per day, provides the most amount of retinol for skin health and hair health. Vitamin C is a little bit deficient, unfortunately. Now, you're still getting a decent amount of vitamin C from the kale before bed at meal five. But I would still advise myself, which I will definitely incorporate, and you guys looking to, uh, you know, try some of these diet practices for yourself, I would still advise you to add at least 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C from supplementation. Now, of course, it would be easier to get vitamin C from fruit, broccoli, kale, spinach, and Brussels sprouts already contain the most amount of vitamin C you can find in vegetables. But hey, a ketogenic diet gives you a little bit of a handicap. So the limited amount of vitamin C that you're going to get is coming from vegetables. And I would still advise everybody to add at least 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C. Maybe 1,000 milligrams with meal one and 1,000 milligrams with meal five. Personally, I do 1,000 milligrams with each meal. But hey, that's just me. I like my absorbic acid to keep some of the glucose transporters active while dietary carbohydrate intake is restricted. Like I mentioned previously, wild Atlantic salmon contains a lot of vitamin D, albeit at less and less and less amount 
probably the less money you spend. And when you purely look at a financial perspective, it's certainly a lot cheaper to supplement with 4,000 or 5,000 IOs of vitamin D3 compared to spending uh, an arm and a leg and uh, your life savings on wild Atlantic <laughs> caught salmon. So keep that in mind. Whole eggs contain a little bit of vitamin D also, but you know, full body sun exposure or vitamin D3 supplementation is probably the best way, the most sustainable way, the most affordable way going forward. I just wanted to mention it here in this video so you guys can see that there's an albeit costly alternative. Now, moving on to vitamin E. When you go to nutritiondata.self.com, they list the vitamin E in milligrams, but most of us are familiar with vitamin E when it comes to international units, IU. So I did a little calculation at the bottom. Of note is that spinach and sunflower seeds, which is the reason why I added in the sunflower seeds over almonds or other seeds or nuts. Sunflower seeds are pretty high in vitamin E, but still 30 grams of sunflower seeds only gives you 10 milligrams of vitamin E. Spinach gives you 3 milligrams of vitamin E. The total is about 24.5 milligrams vitamin E per day, which is only 37 international units. So again, Supplementation might be required if you're trying to resolve non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or you're trying to improve fertility or you just want to add a little bit more antioxidants to your protocol. Supplementation of uh, sunflower, seed, vitamin E mixed, tocopherols and tocotrienols, that's highly advised and it's probably another supplement I would add to this um, otherwise no supplement ketogenic diet. Vitamin K. Well, on this diet, you really don't have to supplement with vitamin K because spinach and kale has uh, basically a vitamin K galore. Now, most of the vegetables and, you know, even the chia seeds contain and the flax seeds contain a little bit of vitamin K. But the total, just from the spinach and the kale alone, brings it up to 2,450, what is it, micrograms of vitamin K. Unfortunately, I'm unsure if that's vitamin K1, vitamin K2, MK4, or MK7. So if you're looking for a particular vitamin K, let's say K2, MK4, you know, a little bit of supplementation might still be desired, or you could lower your spinach or kale intake and uh, get your, you know, specific vitamin K from a supplement instead. Still, it's a very noticeable two and a half what is it, two and a half grams, 2,500 micrograms of vitamin K, uh, you would need, you know, spend a significant amount of money on supplementation to get comparable amounts. Now, the vitamin B1, the B3, uh, the B6, and the B12 is a little bit below par. And it's, again, because we're restricting carbohydrate sources. Many of the B vitamins are readily found in other carbohydrate sources like oatmeal, uh, quinoa, uh, again, sweet potato or uh, white potato, even pasta and, you know, some, some wheat germs, that kind of stuff. But again, we have a little bit of a handicap here because we're trying to restrict our carbohydrate intake. So it might be advised to get a B100 complex or supplement specific B vitamins in because niacin is over the upper tolerable limit. Now, I don't think anybody's going to worry about 70 milligrams of niacin considering that the flush niacin contains 500 milligrams and people take that on a daily basis to get their uh, lipids and cholesterol under control even though it, i think it has no effect on mortality so you know if you like uh parent what is it called parenthesia parenthesia uh, there's much better compounds out there to give you this tremendously you know prickling and tingling sensation in the skin like uh, overdosing the Tadalafil or uh, beta-alanine. Vitamin B9 folate is also over the upper tolerable limit. I don't really think that's an issue considering it's only slightly over. And again, you could simply lower your spinach from 150 grams to only 100 grams and you're you know back into the reference range basically because spinach contains a very high amount of folate. 150 grams of spinach gives you 300 micrograms of folate. For a single serving. And of course, you know, all the other vegetables and, you know, most of the food sources on this list contain variable amounts of folate. Vitamin B12 is uh, pretty low 
it's still of note that salmon and 10 grams of beef liver contain a decent amount of vitamin B12. But I would highly advise everybody to supplement to, you know, 500 micrograms of vitamin B12 at least. Whether that's through in, uh, injectable administrations or, um, you know, the lozenges that you can put underneath your tongue. Because again, you know, vitamin B12 has in most people only a very small part of the intestinal tract where it can actually get absorbed. Now, if you're eating beef on a daily basis and salmon on a daily basis and supplement a little bit of beef liver in, I don't think you'll get into a micronutrient deficiency when it comes to B12. But still, when you're promoting red blood cell production by going on testosterone, primobol, and boldenone, anadrol, or anything else that promotes, uh, you know, an elevation in hematocrit, you still need a little bit more folate, which is covered on this diet. And you probably need to supplement with vitamin B12 just to keep that activity going. You're, you'll get sufficient amount of iron in this diet, so you don't have to worry about that. But vitamin B12 supplementation is probably required. Vitamin B5, pantothenic acid, is good. You could always supplement a little bit more. Again, if you're suffering from acne, you know, you have to mega dose the pantothenic acid. And there's a new version called pantothene available, which is a little bit more potent. So you might want to supplement with that if you're uh, suffering from acne. This diet gives you a thousand milligrams of choline, which is probably not enough for liver health and to prevent non-alcoholic fatty liver disease from manifesting. So I would supplement maybe 2,000 milligrams of choline from a choline and inositol supplement on top. And again, the spinach, man, the spinach is really winning in this race, right? 825 milligrams of betaine, and the rest of the food sources also contain a little bit of betaine. Now, there's no um, dietary reference intake for betaine, but it helps with digestion and stomach acidity levels. Many of us supplement with apple cider vinegar or betaine with pepsin. So, you know, a little bit of spinach with each meal probably has you covered when it comes to stomach acidity. Let's get into the minerals, calcium, chia seeds, spinach, again, and kale all contain notable amounts of calcium. Now, I prefer to get calcium from dietary food sources, whether that's in vegetables or in seeds. And of course, you're going to get some calcium from animal meat sources as well. I prefer to get that um, in food sources so it can slowly absorb and then the vitamin D3, which will have to supplement in this protocol probably, can transport that. And the vitamin K can transport the calcium into bones and not have it linger around in the bloodstream, um, potentially contributing to plaque buildup. Again, that's not what we want. We want that calcium in the bones or in skeletal muscle or in teeth or wherever else calcium gets utilized. And uh, this diet will give you about 1150 milligrams of calcium per day. Now, again, if you start adding apple cider vinegar to each meal or particular vitamin C formulations, you'll probably get another 100 to 150 to even 200 milligrams of calcium with each meal. So keep that in mind. Again, you might have to lower your vegetables if you're supplementing with apple cider vinegar tablets or vitamin C tablets because they also contain a decent amount of calcium. So again, keep that in mind, guys. Now, iron of note, whole eggs. Spinach, again, man, I, I think Popeye was onto something, you know, uh, trimbalone laced spinach. That's where I probably got all this uh, superpowers from. Let's see, beef, obviously higher in iron and probably has the highest bioavailable form of iron being heme iron. So if you see your serum iron levels uh, really increase on this diet, I would cut the beef out, you know, in a heartbeat, basically. Because of all the iron that you find in uh, plant-based sources like chia seeds or vegetables, that's not as readily absorbed as the iron that you can find in beef. So the total brings it to about 28 milligrams of iron per day. For some people, that's going to be too much. For some people, that's going to be too little. The upper tolerable limit for iron is 45 milligrams for both men and women. But the daily reference intakes for men is only 8 milligrams of iron per day. But for women, it's 18 milligrams. Because women lose a significant amount of iron in their menstrual cycle on a month-to-month -month basis. So for the very small amount of women watching, 
stay on top of your beef intake because you're losing a decent amount of iron through your menstrual cycle every month. And if you're not on top of your iron intake through supplementation or by having a little bit of beef on a daily basis, yeah, you might go, what is it called, anoremic or you're missing periods. And it's actually very common in the fitness industry where women don't have periods for months to years on end, uh, which can easily be mitigated by adding a little bit of beef to your diet, even though some women might find it hard to digest. Again, win some, lose some, and there's always supplementation available to bring your serum iron concentrations to sufficient levels when you're again losing a decent amount on a monthly basis otherwise now magnesium it's very difficult to get a decent amount of magnesium required for people who are physically active ideally get about 1500 to 2000 milligrams of magnesium again you know keeping in mind that you're very very physically active and it's very difficult to get that from food sources alone now of course, when you add in the carbohydrates or you raise your calories, you would, you know, noticeably get more magnesium in your diet. But this diet only contains 915 milligrams of magnesium, basically equally spaced out over, you know, animal food sources, the nuts and, and the vegetables. On this diet, spinach and sea bass both contain around 100 milligrams of magnesium. Still, it's not going to be enough. And I would recommend everybody to supplement with 200 milligrams of magnesium bisglycinate with each meal. So that with each meal now, we're already at 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, let's say 500 to 800 milligrams of EPA, DHA from fish oil or krill oil, if you desire, and 200 milligrams of magnesium bisglycinate. So that's, uh, what, 18 tablets per day. Already, plus, let's say, 5,000 IOs of vitamin D3. 19 tablets of supplements per day. Man, you can't, you can't win unless you are sedentary and you're bathing in the sun all day. Um, and then it might not be required. But for everybody out there probably watching this video right now, yeah, some supplementation is still required. Now, phosphorus, I think that's enough. Basically, most of the animal meat sources contain a decent amount of phosphorus, most notably the chicken the sea bass, the beef, and the salmon, and, uh, you know, a cumulative effect of uh, whole eggs, bringing the total to 3,500 milligrams of phosphorus per day. Now, that's more than sufficient. It's close to the upper tolerable limit. I've tried to supplement with 100 and to 200 milligrams of phosphorus with each meal, so an extra 1,000 milligrams of phosphorus coming from supplements, which only go up to, what, 100 milligrams per tablet. A little bit annoying to supplement all of that in, but I didn't notice a difference when it comes to anabolism, recovery, hyperplasia, etc. So I don't think it's really required to get additional phosphorus in. Uh, and that's why I didn't mention it in the electrolyte and, um, you know, micronutrient video that I uh, made a while ago. And I have a corresponding article about that on my website. Potassium, though. With all of these vegetables, the total potassium intake is 8,000 milligrams per day. Now, some of you might uh, seem feel that's alarming because the general recommended intake is 4,700 milligrams of potassium per day. You know, some of the other educators out there uh, try to bring it up to 4,700 and don't go beyond that because uh, they're a little bit worried well, about what people are going to do with their body. And yes, I'm also worried, but hey, that's your responsibility, what you're doing with your body, not my responsibility. Whatever you do with your body, that's uh, on your own discretion. On this diet, you'll get 8,000 milligrams of potassium per day, alongside 3,500 milligrams of sodium per day coming from the Himalaya pink salt. But personally, what I would do is mix this Himalaya pink salt with low sodium potassium salt on a one to one ratio so you can get extra iodine because. As we'll see later, Himalaya pink salt is pretty deficient in iodine. That's why we have iodized Himalaya pink salt out there nowadays with potassium iodide or iodine, I believe. Um, so let, let's save that for later. So the potassium is pretty high, but personally, I would like to bring the potassium intake up to 10,000 milligrams per day by having a little bit of low sodium potassium salt mixed in with my Himalaya pink salt, and again, that low sodium potassium salt contains potassium iodide to keep the metabolism going. Sodium is a little bit higher, maybe for some people. Again, it's over the upper tolerable intake. 
But, you know, considering that everybody's sweating buckets on a daily basis by performing physical activity frequently and for prolonged periods of time, hopefully, you know, hopefully you don't hit it hard for 30 minutes and then go home. That's an Instagram workout, not a hardcore bodybuilding workout. And you will need your sodium. Yeah, take it from me. Sodium is life. Um, sodium, potassium is, uh, considering that your mitochondria are actually uh, benefiting from a decent amount of sodium and potassium to keep the proton pump electron transfer chain going. This sodium intake and potassium intake will give you, uh, you know, very good performance. It certainly does for me, but I like the following ratio when it comes to electrolytes. And this is my personal ratio and the ratio that I use for mo- most of my clients. That's a good starting point. Calcium, magnesium to potassium to sodium ratio of one on the calcium, one and a half on the magnesium, five on the potassium, and two on the sodium. Now, this diet and this micronutrient intake is uh, not very comparable to the ideal electrolyte ratio between these elements. Um, But again, you know, supplementation of magnesium and adding uh, perhaps a little bit of uh, calcium in from vitamin C or apple cider vinegar will probably change this ratio to more favorable balance when it comes to these electrolytes. Let's move on to zinc, the most masculine mineral on this list because it's used in testosterone production, even though a lot of you are probably HPTA impaired and don't require as much zinc as uh, truly drug-free lifters, which still have a fully functional hypothalamic pituitary testes axis. It's still beneficial to get a decent amount of zinc in when you're enhanced, because it's used in the immune system and also in gene transcription. And of course, when you're on anabolics and performance enhancing drugs and causing some hyperplasia, gene transcription is occurring at an accelerated rate. So make sure you stay on top of your zinc intake. Most of the animal meat sources contain about one to one and a half milligrams of zinc. And of note is that this serving of beef contains eight milligrams of zinc. It's still not enough, You're only getting 23 milligrams of zinc on a daily basis with this ketogenic diet. So I would supplement with at least 25 milligrams of zinc picolinate on top. That's another tablet of our, um, you know, ever growing supplementation stack. I would add in another 25 milligrams of zinc, maybe even 50 milligrams of zinc picolinate, maybe even 75 milligrams of zinc picolinate, depending on, you know, how much of an immune boost you need and how much PDs you're on that requires gene transcription up to 100 milligrams of zinc per day um, of that 23 is coming from this diet. Now, copper is uh, basically the opposing female hormone. Zinc and copper both utilize the same uh, transporters in the body, similar to how omega-3 and omega-6 use comparable enzymes and might compete with each other for the same enzymes and how calcium and magnesium use similar cofactors like vitamin K or vitamin D, for example. So it might be advised to space the zinc away from the copper or the calcium from the magnesium or the omega-3 from the omega-6. But in this case, you're always getting a little bit of these micronutrients at the same time. You just don't want to mega dose one or the other. Now with copper of note is that beef liver and salmon contain a decent amount of copper you'll have that at the end of the day and the only real benefit that i can note of course when you get into a copper deficiency you start to get gray hairs some people are able to forego part or all of their gray hairs by supplementing with copper some people get red hairs as a result Either way, you're right in the middle of the dietary reference intake and the upper tolerable limit with about four and a half milligrams of copper per day, all coming from dietary sources. I don't think that supplementation is required. Manganese spinach also contains notable amounts of manganese that's also being used for testosterone production. Deficiency of manganese is very, very rare, so I don't see that you need supplementation of manganese. But this diet also puts you, you know, right in the middle of the DRI and the upper tolerable limit at 6.5 milligrams. Now, this diet is pretty abundant in selenium. You'll get from this diet alone 535 micrograms of selenium on a daily basis. 
But 115 micrograms of that is coming from a single Brazil nut of 6 grams. So if you feel that it's a little bit too much selenium, all you have to do is take the Brazil nut out and you're right at the upper tolerable limit for selenium intake. Just keep in mind that selenium is found and utilized in many organs of the body. It's very present in the testicles, you know, even though you might uh, spread some of that selenium around if you're uh, physically very active because selenium also contributes to semen volume and semen quality and sperm quality. So, you know, a little bit extra is, uh, does have its benefits. It's also found in the D-iodinase enzymes, which convert T4 into active T3. Again, another point for selenium, and it's being used in gene transcription, just like zinc is. So a little bit higher selenium intake, I think that's warranted as a bodybuilder or somebody who's uh, physically active in the gyms or uh, yeah, is physically active with a partner or five, right? So... An extra Brazil nut here or there will bring your selenium intake up over the tolerable limit. And again, you know, spread that around and you should be okay. If you believe in conspiracy theories, you might want to remove the avocado because it will bring your fluoride intake over the upper tolerable limit. So if you're one of those guys, remove the avocados and replace them with almonds or a nut of your preference. Eggs still contain a little bit of fluoride, and I believe the beef also contains a little bit of fluoride, even though it's not mentioned on this Excel sheet. Um, but yeah, fluoride intake is unavoidable, and you know, I'll leave it up to you on how you want to proceed with this diet. The iodine intake um, is a little bit on the low side, simply because iodine content of most of the food sources on this list are unknown. I do know for eggs that it contains, for two whole eggs, about 60 micrograms of iodine. And beef liver contains a little bit of iodine. But again, like I mentioned before, it might be beneficial to replace the Himalaya pink salt for regular old iodized table salt or an iodized low sodium potassium salt if you're willing to increase your potassium intake a little bit more for performance benefits. So this diet only gives you 63 micrograms of iodine, but it could be a little bit higher because the iodine content of some of these food sources is simply unknown, just like the chromium content of some of the food sources. So I was able to piece it together for eggs and beef liver, but for most of the other food sources, I wasn't able to figure out the iodine and the chromium content or its in negligible amounts. If you want to increase your iodine intake besides iodized stable salt, look at the kelp or seaweed that contains a decent amount of iodine, um, you know, maybe even over the upper tolerable limit. So I would limit the iodine exposure on a daily basis to the upper tolerable limit being about 1100 micrograms of iodine on a daily basis. And when it comes to chromium, even the two whole eggs and 10 grams of beef liver per day will already bring you three times over the dietary reference intakes at 101 micrograms chromium per day. And again, you know, a lot of these uh, glucose disposal agents contain chromium. Personally, I don't like to take any additional chromium picolinate because I saw a correlation with kidney health and overdoing the chromium and whether that's for higher dosages for shorter duration or moderate dosages for prolonged periods of time. Personally, I don't like chromium piconolate supplementation in glucose disposal agents or, you know, get additional chromium from dietary sources. So I would say that 101 micrograms chromium per day is more than sufficient to keep your insulin sensitivity going, considering that magnesium, fish oil, and a ketogenic diet is pretty um, pretty productive when it comes to your insulin sensitivity because you're limiting your carbohydrate intake to vegetables only, 53 grams per day on this diet. Now, this is just an indication of what is possible with food sources alone. You don't always have to throw a kitchen sink at it to get a ton of micronutrients because, again, your food sources also contain micronutrients, unless you're one of those uh, crazy ones that is going with processed food for everything, and you're eating fortified cereals. You know, yeah, those guys are out there, uh, probably not watching this video, but they're still out there. 
uh, they usually somewhere at the diabetes clinic, you know, uh, why, why, why do I have poor insulin sensitivity? I don't understand, you know, this fortified cereals with magnesium and all the micronutrients that I need, you right? Just try to get it from whole foods and whatever you can get from whole foods, add in supplementation. That's totally okay because even a dietary reference intake or the operatorial will limit is just a guideline and you'll have to adjust all your micronutrients based on your performance, your health, your well-being and your ability to absorb them or excrete them, right? Some people absorb particular micronutrients a little bit worse than others or some of them lose them. Like I lose sodium on, you know... uh, uh, a moment's notice, basically, because it's so hot here in Thailand and I'm sweating buckets as soon as I leave this uh, comfort of the air conditioning. So my sodium intake might be a lot higher compared to people who live in a colder climate and, and barely sweat. All right? So you all have to adjust these micronutrients and the food sources to make it suit your needs and make it work for you. This is just a pretty good start. I'll put this diet in the Excel sheet form on a Dropbox and link it down below for the guys that made it to the end of this uh, Man, it's probably going to be one hour. I'll try to cut it down a little bit. For the guys that made it to the end, the Dropbox link is down below. It doesn't contain all the formulas because those formulas took years to compose. Those are my formulas. But I do use this uh, formula Excel sheet for all of my clients that are interested in their micronutrient intake as well. And then again, I'll you know list whatever supplement protocol they're on into this in the, into their personalized diet sheet as well so we can see the overall micronutrient intake and all the phytochemicals and the you know omega-3s and the cholesterol etc 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 really hope this helps and was informative for you guys to see how far you can get with a ketogenic diet alone again additional supplementation is required i'll leave it up to you and your decision making process either way thank you for watching highly appreciate it vigorous crew you guys know what to do much love. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the ebooks on my website, vigorousteve.com slash shop. If you're looking for personalized advice, you can find the rates to my services in the services section. Contact me directly if you're interested. Follow me on Instagram at vigorousteve. Thank you so much for watching and sitting through all these micronutrients, which I'm sure this video will probably only get a thousand views in 24 hours. But if you're watching... You are awesome and you care about your health and I salute you. See you in the next video.